G'day, Penny from PPA. Welcome to this week's show, The Problem Investment Guys, the only place to be for real facts, real figures, and real flaming hot spots. Look, today we have a video about NDIS and the 10 most key points you must get right if you're looking to have success when it comes to investing in the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Okay, so look, why I'm making this is because we, we, get, we get so many inquiries a day on people wanting to invest in NDIS and they have lots of questions. Uh, and look, I, I answered uh, one client's emails today. Um, he must have had almost 30 questions just uh, for, for with one client. Most of the questions are much the same uh, along uh, with each client you talk to, but these are the 10 key things you want to make sure you get right if you want to have success investing in NDIS. Okay, so let's get stuck into it. You know, why is the government paying you 80 to 150k per annum for 20 years? Now, let's clarify that, okay? So there is very strong returns you can, you can gain with NDIS. You know, 11% plus yield, which is very strong. Um, we think the average property uh, being uh, bought for investment, for a traditional investment in Australia, you're lucky at a 5% rental return on that property, especially with the prices rising in, in, uh, in purchase prices, uh, and it's hard for rents to actually keep up. What I'm saying is a 5% yield would be, if you're at $1,000, uh, sorry, a million dollar property and you're getting a $1,000 a week rent, that's approximately 5% yield uh, for easy mass. So, uh, when you look at NDIS, the yields are so much stronger because you have uh, you know, payments, you have your NDIS allocation um, and your RRC, your reasonable rental contribution, paid uh, via the Centrelink and via the, the, uh, from the participant, but generally all, all, all of it's coming from the government indirectly, uh, whether, whether, it, whether, whether it is the NDIS allocation or it is the uh, RRC, okay, reasonable rental contribution. So, why are the returns are so high? Uh, well, they're, they're, they're that high based on the participants in the home. So if you've got a, a, a two participant home or a, a two participant bill or one, one participant per side or, or four billers in a row, four single participant billers, then, then your returns can vary from you know, around the 80K up to $250,000 per annum. And it is for 20 years, your certification a PPA guarantee a certification uh, of your property when you when it is built, uh, importantly built to the specifications, um, and that 20 year time frame is then you, that property has a number. It's rolled over with the uh, uh, rolled in over with the SDA, up, uploaded into the uh, NDIS portal, um, and enrolled as a uh, SDA home, and and the and that. SDA generally has a, uh, a 20 year head lease with you, which is, can be make, made up of 10 plus 5 plus 5, or 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2, etc. 10 times 10. It depends on what uh, their specific head lease um, terms and times are. But you can discuss that with them before you invest in any property with PPA. It's very important that you do speak to the SDA before you're financially committed to a investment because it is a specific and specialised. Um, top of investment. Okay, so returns can be very high based on that you have a good SDA and they have, they have strong participant pathways to give you that demand you, that you do need. Um, you know, so that, that leads on to the second part of this question, you know, why working with SDAs and SILs is critical. And now when I say working, the missing word there is qualified, quality, uh, and people that really care about people with disability is so important because there's lots of SDAs out there that uh, have little to no experience in the SDA space and don't have those SIL provider connections. That SIL stands for Support Independent Living, SDA stands for Specialist Disability Accommodation Providers. Okay, so the SDAs are looking after the home, placing the participants, they have a property management arm underneath them to maintain that home for you. The SIL providers are providing the OOA, which is the on-site overnight assistant in the house to give the have a care in the house and that that uh, sewer provider is very very important uh, along with um, you know there's support coordinators who are like the managers of the, the participants there's department of housing there's there's um, uh, public guardians there's social housing there's this whole range of locations where the the, the people with disability are now you know, living in poor group houses or hospitals or nursing homes and, they, and they, the government wants to get them out of there and that's why the government is paying that's really the why the drive you know, why are they paying such high returns 
that's really the driver is that they, they, they you know the people with disability deserve a better place to live uh, and get, getting out of these you know institutions like hospitals and nursing homes which are, are obviously aren't ideal for a, with, for a person especially a younger person uh, or any age doesn't matter if you're not in an old age home because you're old age you don't want to be there um, uh, but they're forced to live there because there's nowhere else for them to go. So that's why the government has this uh, uh, incentive to, as an investor, they, they want investors to buy the properties and then, then the SDAs manage the properties and the super providers provide the carers in the home. So it's critical you work with the right ones who have, you know, uh, truly do care about the, the, the people with disability and they truly do um, have the, the contacts uh, the networks of, uh, of the supervisors, sport coordinators and the like I just mentioned because they have the demand to actually fill your home with, uh, with tenants or with participants as they call them in the NDIS space um, to make sure you get the returns you need to get the sort of returns up here. Okay, so very important you work with the right ones. Uh, and PPA will work with different STAs all over the country. Uh, in most cases, we're building uh, for a specific STA, but in most cases, we'll have um, uh, it will give, we can give you another option as well, so you have peace of mind that you have uh, more than one STA to speak to. And you've got an obligation to stay with our STAs. There has been times where, where clients have chosen their own STA uh, for whatever reason, so that, that's fine. We have no financial commitment to or connection with, uh, with any of the STAs or SILs we work with. It's just about providing our clients with the best services possible that we can find in this space over the past three years. Okay, so, but importantly, as I mentioned before, you will speak to the SDA before you're financially committed after the contract, but before you're financially committed, so you can move forward when you're 100% confident in your decision. Okay, so the next question is, how do you guarantee your NDIS bill certification? So I mentioned at the start there that PPA do, um, do, do guarantee our building certification. We, it all starts with having a very good uh, a team that we work with. We have different build contractors all over the country, and it starts with having the drafting work done uh, correct and certified correctly, and actually building these properties over and above specifications. And that's what we really do here at PPA. There is certain specifications, certain sizes, certain requirements uh, that the NDIS has for their compliance for the 2021. Uh, sorry, 2022. 2021, sorry, it was last year, July 2021, they brought out the new new um, SDA requirements. Um, and as long as you're building to those, you'll get certification. But you want to build well, we build well over and above that. You really do want to do that. Uh, I'll explain why in a moment. But if you're building over and above those specifications, you guarantee you'll get, specific, you'll get compliance. But it's not just the sizes and the, specif and, and the specifications. You know, the tolerance is much tighter. You know, you can't have a, a, a wall that's a, a, a hallway that's, for example, if it was meant to be 1500 down the hallway, 1500 wide, and it was, you know, 1540, it was 1455, and it was just, you know, this much too narrow, well, you won't get compliance. And, and that's going to be a real problem when you already have a finished house, okay? So, um, yes, the certifiers do inspect the house throughout the construction, so they might pick it up early, but still, it's not going to be easy to change, uh, it's going to cost, cost money. But it doesn't come cost to you. Like we, we've had over the, uh, the years of building NDIS houses, especially in the early days, there was some problems, just minor things, um, you know, I, I can't go into more because it takes too long, but in the end of the day, there were some problems, but we fixed them, the client just doesn't pay for them, it comes out of our cost, uh, and our, with, with, which are the costs that we share. We share our bill margin with the, uh, bill, with the bill contractor, and any problems that could occur with that, uh, that build, then we make sure that uh, we get that dealt with uh, on your behalf and you aren't paying for it. So that's how you, that's how one, you build over and above specifications, and two, PPA will uh, honor our guarantee to make sure that the house is certified at no, no cost to you. Uh, how, do you, how do you get paid? That's a good question. It's a rental property, you want to get paid. You get paid on a monthly basis. Uh, the, the, the government will pay the SDA, the NDIS, NDIA, NDIA will pay the SDA. The SDA has, a, has two partner payments, the RRC, the Regional Rental Contribution, which is 100% of the participants' living allowance and 25% of, the, of their disability allowance, plus the NDIS allocation. And that, that, that amount varies depending on the, the level of care, the type of dwelling, the location of the, the property in the country or the suburb. 
that varies as returns, but they get paid to the STA and on a monthly basis, the, uh, the STA will pay you, the, the uh, homeowner, the investor, the landlord for that property, okay, less their management fee. And their management fees do vary from sort of 10 to 15% depending on who you're working with. Some are higher, but that, that's how, that's the that's the parents on who we work with. Okay, so that's how you get paid, much like a normal property, you get paid your normal traditional investment, you get paid monthly by your property manager. This is much the same, it's just uh, SDO power coming directly, indirectly from the government. How much, how much money, how much cash or equity do you need to invest in NDIS? That again obviously depends on the price of the property, but it, there's, uh, it was really tough getting financed in the early days for NDIS. Um, valuations were low because there was nothing to compare them to. They didn't take into consideration all the extra costs to go into building an NDIS house. There's over $100,000 of extra costs to go into building an NDIS house, depending on what you're building. Um, but if you're building, let's use an easy mass of $800,000, if you're buying an $800,000 um, uh, property, you, you would need a minimum of 10% because uh, with, with one of the brokers we would re recommend to you, uh, they were at 1090 LVR, now there'd be costs on top of that, so not just 10%. So you, know, you would need probably 15% more realistically because there's gonna be costs. Um, they do the commercial valuations, the commercial valuations do cost money, they're around $3,000 for a commercial valuation. Uh, it's worth every dollar you spend though. It's rather because the, the commercial valuations come back pretty much on the money, sometimes over the purchase price, occasionally under, but very close to the purchase price. So you're not putting in the shortfall out of your pocket or out of your equity uh, to cover that cost. Um, and uh, so, they, so therefore they do have some costs, but that's, you know, if it's going to give you, if it's $100,000 short in valuation, that's $100,000 you need to find for that $3,000, approximately $3,000 valuation, then that's that's worth every cent to get that uh, purchase price uh, as per the um, the investment that you're buying. So, so look, it, a lot of people go with the 2080 LVR, land value ratio, so 20% deposit and, and costs, and, and the rest is borrowed funds. Now that 20% or 10% can come from your cash or can come from equity in your home or one of your other investment properties. But look, we'll, if you would like to speak to a specialist in NDIS funding, because I can't give you financial advice, so speak to an NDIS uh, specialist funder, give us a call, go to the website, you click on a button there that we can do an introduction to you. Again, no money for us, it's just about helping you out. Uh, have a chat to them and, uh, and, just, and they'll work out your personal circumstances. You might have some savings, they might recommend using some of it, they might recommend not using any of it. You might have lots of equity in multiple properties, it all depends on your personal circumstances, what your incomes are, what your debt to service ratio is, how much debts do you have on your own house and own properties, your credit cards, your cars, and how much you're servicing, what's your income, your personal income with the, with the partner and your income, or you've got multiple properties with income, your business with income, whatever it could be, and then do you have dependents, all those sort of things, and what's that ratio? Uh, and then they'll work out what is your servicing calculator, give you a pre-approval to go in and spend uh, $900,000, hypothetically, and you might come to PPA and say, look, I, I, I can borrow 900, here's a pre-approval letter, but uh, I'm only happy to spend up to 750 right now. Whatever it could be, it's, it's all up to you. So, but you, so you, but you can get a 90-10 uh, LBR, uh, but just so you're aware, that 10% person, person, uh, portion, portion, sorry, person, uh, percentage, uh, is actually a better word to use, is, uh, is at a higher rate than the other 80%. So most of my 2080 LBRs, they're pretty, you know, very competitive rates up with the normal banks, what, are, what, are, uh, what they're charging. But if you, got, if you need to go down to a 90, 10 LPR, that 10% portion is much higher. All right, hope that was helpful. So, just on, on the I guess to answer that question, of on $800,000, I'm, I'm sure you know your maths, but 10% of $800,000 is obviously 80, 20% uh, of $800,000 is $160,000 plus costs, okay? Yeah, that, and that, that'll be stamp duty on the land only, so if it's a $200,000 block of land, uh, that's going to be roughly six thousand uh, dollars plus you say three thousand dollars for your valuation fees um, and any, any other costs you might have so your solicitor fees might be around two thousand dollars as well um, so these sort of your costs you would need I can, if you want to know more about costs just certainly come to us if you want to speak to a broker uh, we can recommend who to talk to 
So why, now why should you not invest in apartments? Then you certainly can invest in apartments, that's up to you, it's your investment, I'm not gonna tell you what you can and can't do, but why I'm saying this, and this is a very key point, uh, I don't mean an apartment that's in a high rise building and they've, they've got, say, there might be 100 apartments and they're putting 15 of those apartments, they're gonna be NDIS. That could be okay, I don't know, we don't deal with that at all. Um, it's not what our SDAs request. We only we only build what our SDAs want, okay? So where they want them. So, and but as far as the apartments, what I mean is two, three, four, six pack apartments. So small apartment complexes. They cost you a couple million dollars to build. Three pound again, depending on the land. The land needs to be in really good location, so you're gonna pay a premium for the land, and you're gonna pay a premium for the bill because it's obviously much bigger. And initially, we look at the NDIS calculator. You know, for a, a two-bedroom apartment with a with a single uh, approved uh, independent living um, uh, high physical support participant with their RRC, it's almost one hundred thirty thousand, one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year. I think it's I think it's one hundred twenty plus ten RRC. Look, don't get me wrong. I, I don't look at this because it's uh, it's not what we do because we're told not to over almost two years ago now by the SDAs because you know the government doesn't really want isn't funding many people for that type of dwelling. But we look at the mass, yeah, back back then you could buy, you know, two years ago when build prices were cheaper to, to build and to buy land. For example in Brisbane you could buy a block of land for say six hundred thousand dollars, do a four pack on there for about one point five million and it might cost you two point one million. So it's a lot of money. But if you're getting, you know, you know if you had four apartments and they're getting $120,000 each plus RRC of another 20, that's $320,000 a year. It's a huge returns. Um, and unfortunately, many people have been buying have been sold apartments on a commercial valuation. So they might say in that scenario, that's $3.2 million, $320,000 return per annum, get a commercial valuation, they'll get the valuation at $3 million and then people are buying them for $3 million. You know, unfortunately, they're gonna be very lucky if they can actually fill those apartments with, with those high-end high -end participants who are funded for the highest amount. I'm sure they'll fill those apartments, but they might get people who are, who are, who are funded to live, live in a share house, which is, say, $40,000 a year. It's a hell of a lot shorter than, than what a, what a you know, $100,000, uh, $120,000 is a year. So, just, I guess the, the terminology I heard from one of the SDAs said it, there is uh, to, to get a, 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 a participant approved for that amount of money is like seeing a unicorn fly by. So obviously that's pretty rare. Okay, so I would recommend not spending the big dollars into a, into a complex unless you are building fit for purpose. The SDA has has a, 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 to participants to move in with a letter of intent, and uh, even then with the time frames to build, there's no guarantee they're still gonna be there in two, three years time. So I would just be very cautious of that investment. Okay, don't get paid, don't pay too much. So, certainly don't pay on a commercial valuation because you know that's only gonna end up with a 10%, uh, sorry, 5% at best uh, at yield. You know, I'll talk about these high yields. Well, that's, because you, if you're paying a full price, then you you are paying, you, you, you know, you're lucky at 5%. So yeah, it's a big investment. Be cautious of that. So, why should you? Oh, sorry, this. What uh, changes has there been in the past 12 months? Well, the biggest thing from our perspective is uh, you know where we're building and what we're building. I guess is the two the two biggest changes from our, our perspective. It's uh, you know most of Queensland now has the SDAs have their quota. Many marketing companies because land's cheap are just flogging the death out of uh, Queensland. So I would probably avoid Queensland right now unless you have an SDA that has participants ready to move in. We, we do build fit for purpose houses in Queensland still and we'll continue to do so because the SDAs have income participants, that's different. Um, but otherwise I would certainly look at uh, you know where and what to build um, and uh, be avoiding uh, Queensland. There's certainly other parts of the whole country you, you, can, you can be building in. Um, and but yeah, that's one big one. It would be just watch the quotas. There's obviously more more houses being built. Um, secondly, make sure you're building you know big quality built homes. You know what we were building two years ago 
uh, is you know which was based on the SDH requirements back then, well over and above this, the NDI specifications. But compared to what they ask for now, uh, there's a substantial size difference in the properties, uh, which is probably one of the biggest changes. Therefore, bigger size does mean more cost, unfortunately. But if you've got slightly more costs and you've got you know you've got a, providing a much better home for the income participants, they're likely to stay there for the long term and, and give you a very good long term investment. So your location and what you build is important and, and so we, we do a lot of a lot more duplexes, villas than houses. We do still do a lot of houses, uh, two participant houses, three participant houses with you know two living spaces and our frescoes and private frescoes and kitchenettes, all types of little things, a lot of other little mod cons that we put in there um, to make it a better home. But, you know, the big thing so is that location. Okay, what does uh, the new government mean to NDIS? Well, you know, we saw a report a couple of weeks ago that, that the uh, Labor government's very keen to improve the NDIS. They're investigating why so much money hasn't was has been spent that's gone to the wrong places. Uh, they're investigating that, which should be great um, to identify that wastage. They're trying to speed up the, the time frames because when we hear ongoing problems that the the SDAs and the, and their fund manager, the people who organise the fund manage the funds uh, for the specific participant, because each participant has their own funding based on their level of care, whether they're physical or mental disability or what levels of care they are, what, what, what do they need, do they need to live with by themselves, do they need one-on-one -on -one care, do they need two-on-one -on -one care, do they have one-on-two care or one-on-three care, you know, what is their specific needs, do they need electric hoist out of, the, out of their ceiling to help them out of, out of bed, do they need automated doors and windows and blinds, what do they need? Everyone's different, so their funding is based on that and that funding they receive, uh, people with disability, is what you receive as the investor in the SDA return. So, but to get people fund, the fund managers to help them get this, this funds through and people to get their approvals has been very slow, which puts a real bottleneck into, into the houses. The property's being built and there's a large number of people who need to be out of nursing homes and hospitals, but they, to get their funding approved to go into the house has been very slow. So the government, the late Labor government's can look at speeding that up. Um, and just talking to SDAs last week, they have already seen a difference, which is, which is good news. Um, and they want to increase the returns. So I think by 2023, the SDA and SDA told me last week, by 2023, July, they'll look at increasing the your returns with NDIS because of the costs of properties have gone up so much and bill prices have gone up so much to make these numbers work uh, and attract investors long term, they need to put up those returns. And they already are, are outstanding returns. They could be going up, the well, SDA said, don't quote me on it, around 20%. So that's, it does go by that much, that's awesome, but we'll see what happens with more crystal ball, but that's the talk around that. So, so, so the, basically, I guess the biggest takeaway from that is that the, the Labor government is very proactive on wanting to do what they can to improve the pathway, so to get through people quicker, get them into homes sooner, you know, and increase their returns, and uh, and just and just get rid of all the, the garbage, that's the, the litigation that's been going on with, uh, behind the scenes that the, that was recreated, created by you know um, the uh, previous government not putting the funds through at the right, right amount. So I think what I, what, I, what I hear is that people might apply for their funding, they might only get, uh, you know, hypothetically uh, 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 improvability funding, but they should be fully accessible at next, at next level up. And then they go and try to fight the, the government over that to get more money, and then that becomes litigation, that causes issues, and that's, again, been a waste of money. There's been millions spent on just lawsuits for the government, which should be, that money should be way better spent. Uh, by the Labor government into um, the NDIS, NDIA um, schemes. Okay, so, so good news basically is what, is what that means. So, what crucial design features for long-term tenancy? I guess the, I, I've already sort of covered that up, up here uh, when I talk about you know the size of the house, size of the villa, you know, we, we have you know, kitchenettes in the bedrooms, private alfrescos, you know, gardens, nice views outside their own private alfresco. And I'm not just looking at a fence, you know, it's tough, good, good inclusions within the house. And is there a furniture pack in there? Is there you know, a TV on the, you know, everything they need so they walk in and feel like 
they're at home in their own house. And they, we make these houses look like a normal home. The, the, the en suites do look uh, a little bit like a hospital because there's no shower, uh, glass shower cubicle, there's actually a big screen, shower uh, curtains like you see in a hospital uh, bathroom with obviously disabled handles and, and toilets and handrails and, and the like and basins they can get their wheelchair under and those sort of things. So, so I mean, yes, they, those en suites do look like uh, it is for just a person with a disability, which it has to be. The rest of the house really looks like a normal house and that's for two reasons. One, we want them to, you know, the people with disability moving in to feel like they're in a home, not in some sort of institution or hospital. Um, and two, for, you know, to keep, you know, to, to keep uh, the property in a state that in the future, you might want to resell that property to a traditional uh, homeowner or to people, people uh, investors. It depends on what you're trying to achieve with your, you know, how long you keep the property for. Probably sell to an investor if it was still in the 20 year time frame. After that 20 year time frame, you can roll it into existing stock, your returns do, do approximately half. We might want to just you know, resell it uh, as a traditional build. So we want the house to look like a normal house so they feel comfortable and they stay there long term with, with all the, because it's a nice location, nice place to live. You know, just like the you know, people with a disability are no different than you and I, they want to live in a good location, a nice home, and be proud of their own place. It's pretty simple. Okay, uh, where should you invest now? That's always the question we, we get. Where is the most demand for NDIS properties? Well, it's, it is, I would say, I would avoid most of Queensland unless it is a, uh, a fit for purpose income participant home right now. Otherwise, the rest of the country really is, uh, uh, has, still has high demand. We have, when I say demand, we don't talk to the participants about where the demand is. Yes, you can, you can go to the NDIS website, there's stats there. We have SDAs that provide us with, uh, with reports. And, but importantly, it's the SDAs that we work with around the country and that's Australia wide that, uh, that actually would come to us and say, look, I need, a, I need a villa here, I need a duplex there, I need a robust house there, I need a, a high physical support house there. So we're in Darwin, you know, all through New South Wales, country areas, um, you know, Perth, Adelaide, Victoria, country, Victoria, Melbourne, and the country, Sydney, you know, also, um, yeah, New South Wales, Victoria, uh, South Australia, Western Australia, um, and Northern Territory. So most of the country, it's really only, um, as I said before, Queensland that we're only doing a few properties here and there um, as we're requested to build that fit for purpose property. But again, the thing is, is your investment. What's your comfortable investment value? What's your budget? What do you want to invest at? So have a chat to us about that because that makes a big difference. If your budget's you know a certain amount, there's only going to be a couple of places you might be able to invest in the country because the cost to buy land and the build is, might be might be too high for you. So you might be limited to a, to two or three locations. Uh, so again, have a chat to us and we can work out what is right for you in your personal circumstances. I hope you found that helpful. Um, as always, Peter from PPA, keeping it real, have a great day. If you want to invest in NDIS, it's an awesome investment to help people with disability, give you strong returns, helps the government out with, with money. Because again, why, this is, a, I think I'll come back to the, where I started, the why again, to help the, get people out of the, get people with disability out of these nursing homes and hospitals because it's costing the government up to up to a million dollars apparently to leave one person in the hospital for a year, about eighty to hundred thousand dollars in a nursing home. So the government's saving money by you investing in NDIS, and that's why it is out there. And obviously to get get people with disability out in the community um, and get better care. <clears throat> that's enough talking for me for now. Till next time, have a great day and. Cool. All the best for your success.